Wow, what a powerful name. Amen? Give God honor and glory for that. I'll tell you what the name of Jesus can do. In May, uh, I'm sorry, April 29th of 1992, I was saved. I called upon the name of Jesus. That, and that, that alone, that direction is where I traveled to be saved that day. I've, I've heard the name of Jesus proclaimed, and I've seen, I've seen sickness healed. I've seen light, broken lives mended and made all new, and it's not because of what somebody did. It's because of what Jesus did for all of us. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Amen. I'm glad to be here. I mean just some. Y'all don't know what that is, do you? That's from Texas. That's from Paris, Texas. This old buddy of mine out there in Paris, Texas, whose name is Lyle, uh, uh, Lyle Yoder. Lyle said, he called me Buck all the time. He said, he said, Buck, you are crazy, just some. It took me a little while, and then I figured out, I guess I am just crazy, just some. Amen? But I tell you what I am. I'm saved today. I am saved today. And I'm going to challenge you right now to, to think back on something. I remember that Wednesday night that I had that conversation with Jesus Christ when I asked him to come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, and to save my soul so that I could live with him forever. I remember that night so vividly. Do you have recollection of that conversation that you had with Jesus? Now you think about that just for a little bit. This morning, I need to go ahead and start off and preface this entire message with the first part of an apology. So we're going to have a little bit of group therapy right now, okay? So you got your little worship God there thing, and you got that, that little outline. Look at it. It's wrong. It should say 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. And I promised Brother Donnie I would do this. <clears throat> Brother Donnie did not make that mistake. I sent him the wrong the wrong thing but it's just the next book down so just just take your pens and mark that that number one off and put a two right there and we'll be good to go amen same bible so <clears throat> i asked him if i could freelance a little bit this morning and he had this real really uh bemused look on his face like how much you gonna freelance because the thing is, I've noticed with Brother Russ, I do what I, a lot of what I, I call double dipping. I'll come to the, to the 8 o'clock and the 1030, and, and then I did that when, when Dominic preached. And those guys are good, okay? They can preach the 8 o'clock, and when they get to the 1030, it's almost like, boom, they can do it again. I'm not that guy. I have no idea what you're going to get yet, but it's going to be good because I promise it's coming from God's Word. So I'm very ADD, I'm dyslexic, and I'm getting old. <laughs> Works out pretty good in my favor. <laughs> so, so we're going to do things just a little bit differently. And I, this is something I, I asked Brother Donnie if he thought it would be okay. And he said, you know what? He said, I love that. So if you will, if you have your Bibles, turn to check, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading at verse 16. But I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Would you do that, please? And the Bible says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Someone say amen. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now listen to this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the very moment. And now, Lord, I pray that 
everything that is said and done will be to glorify you, to draw someone closer to you. And God, I pray that if there is someone here today who is lost and undone, who can't recall that conversation of asking you to be Savior, that today they would, they would complete that conversation and that they would trust you to save their soul. I pray, Lord, for sinners, all of us, of whom we are many, God, that today we would reconcile ourselves to you. As Christians, as a church, we would, be, we would draw closer to each other so that we could be stronger. Watch over us and bless this time. In Jesus' name we ask, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. By nature, all, all of us humans, we possess this certain innate uh, ability or, or need, rather, and a certain level of needing to fit in or be part of a group and to be uh, connected with someone. And just to be in that close-knit relationship means a whole lot to, to me. Now, for those of you, or for those of us, actually, who've been married for an awfully long time, and if I don't get killed or something happened to me and y'all don't know something else about me, then this July I'll be married 39 years to that pretty girl right there. Raise your hand, honey. <laughs> y'all pray for her. <laughs> 39 years. Now I messed up one time. Or maybe twice. Yesterday. Before that, there's buku of times I have messed up. And you know what I had to do? Something that most of us as people don't like to do, we have to say, I'm wrong. I know, guys, you're thinking right now, oh, no way, dude, you, you can't be wrong. Right? Scared now, aren't you? I'm not going to say anything because she's sitting next to you. I get it. It's okay. So anyway, I've had to say that I was wrong a lot of times. And I've had to reconcile issues and dilemmas and, is and problems that Debbie and I were having. Is it important to do that in a marriage? It is if you want to keep it going. Amen? It is. It's, it's, it's important to reconcile with one another if we're Christians in a church family. Amen? Now, we got a pretty good church here, don't we? And so... As good as this church is and as strong as this family is, guess what? We have problems. Because just as Brother Russ has so eloquently said, we're a bunch of self-centered sinners who are all gathered in one place. And when you have that kind of conundrum happen, guess what? It happens. Somebody gets a little irritated at this group and that group. And you know what? We shouldn't have those groups and those cliques. Amen, Steve. Somebody had to do it. But we do, folks. And when things happen like that, there's times that we need to say, I'm sorry. Okay, I was wrong. Perhaps sometimes we don't have to be wrong. Sometimes you don't have to be wrong, but, some, but we always, as Christians, we need to keep ever before us the need to get along, to have unity. Amen? Amen. How are we going to grow if we can't grow together? Here's the deal. If we can't grow together, guess what we do? We'll grow apart. That kind of growth hurts a church. We live in a time now, and I, I mentioned this several weeks ago, Brother Ron Allen allowed me to, to teach our life group. And during that time, this lesson came up about reconciliation. And during the whole time I was preparing, the week, the week that I was preparing to teach this lesson, the Holy Spirit was continually just inundating me with, with all kind of information about reconciliation. And, and I'm thinking, well, somebody needs this message. And then I got it. It was me. It was me. I needed to reconcile myself with God. But wait, you're a preacher. You've been a pastor for over 20 years. You shouldn't make those kind of mistakes. Newsflash, we do. And we're not perfect. We fail. 
But we have a God that that powerful name of Jesus, we can cry out in that name, in that name alone, is enough power when we ask forgiveness and he says, yes, I'll remember it no more. That's a yee-haw moment. Amen? And so this morning I want us to think about something about division. And I've shared this with our class and I've shared it with the, with the, the early morning service. But we live in a time where it, this is one of the most volatile periods in American history. Because the way the, the Democratic and the Republican parties have separated, we, we, we've allowed things to come in between us, folks. We have allowed things to happen to the United States of America, and we have, uh, that, that shouldn't have happened. And then we also open the door for problems when we do that, because when we separate, we get in trouble. And I can't help but think back to the, to the greatest generation that's ever lived, the World War II veterans and that that group of people amen that generation that generation was awesome we have among us some veterans from ww2 brother joe such a just a a a hero in my life and in my eyes and i think about how these these men and women you know what they said this win at all cost. They laid party lines aside. They laid denominational factors and issues aside. They laid color and race and anything else aside because they became one nation. And when they became one nation, the world couldn't defeat us. Guess what? We are back-to-back World War champions. Amen. Yeah. Because America came together. My question is... Why can't Christians do that today? Pretty good one, isn't it? Well, do you know any families like this? Do you know any families that you've got issues? I know most families are perfect, right? Till you show up at family reunion time. But do you know any family that has issues that the, that the, that the, the brothers and the sisters and the cousins and everybody, I'm not talking to them. They got mama's bouquet from the wedding when she died. And I didn't get one of those flowers. They did this. They did that. Folks, we've got to start reconciling our families so we can reconcile ourselves with God. Amen again. So I think about these kind of things when I'm, when I'm preparing these messages because guess what? It doesn't just... Involve you, it involves me and everybody else. Because we're all this family of God. First of all, let's look at God's purpose for reconciliation. In verses 16 through 17 of our text, it says, therefore, from now on. Folks, I can tell you this, from now on, when I got saved, God, and in, 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 in through his son Jesus, there was a dramatic change in my life. I went from drinking beer with almost every waking moment to wanting to go somewhere, to to having a desire to go to a a church to hear the word preached. We went to a lot of church meetings and a lot of worship services. And when Damon, my son, was a little bitty fellow, we would go from one church to another to another to go hear this preacher, to go over here to hear this one, to go to that revival, go to our home church that night. And, and one day, bless his heart, he just got fed up with it, and he was tired. And he said, church, 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 that's all we do. He said, can't we go home? I agree, sometimes we just need to go home, but we need to go home with our families. Amen? But I had this desire, I had this need in my heart that I had to see filled And I would go and I would share the word. Mike Quick, one of the members here, I did a job for Mike back in 1993, I think it was, the first job that I did for him. About 10 minutes after I met Mike, I asked him, I said, are you a Christian? Are you saved? And he was sharing that with, I think, Brother Charlie Schrader out in the the foyer here a while back. He said, 
He said, I hadn't been with him 10 or 15 minutes, and he was already giving me the 10th degree about, are you saved? Folks, that's what we're supposed to do. We see in the text that from now on we're supposed to be changed. Folks, we're supposed to be changed. Amen? So has God made that dramatic, radical change in your life? Look at that, because that's a really good barometer of which way we're going. As if God has changed your life or not. So God's purpose for reconciliation is very, very critical. When you study 2 Corinthians, you understand that Paul was addressing issues and problems that the churches was having back then. And they were, he was providing solutions through God's directions. They were questioning him as, are you a true apostle? They, didn't, they had doubts, and so they were making accusations against him. But Paul uses this, this term, from now on... To describe where he was and where his view has shifted. Folks, i got to tell you something. When I got saved from that day on, my view shifted. I saw things a little differently. And i got to tell you something. That if you have not had that radical change in your life and you can't see things differently, I would question myself this morning. Amen? It doesn't hurt to say you're wrong. It may sting a little. But if we as Christians make the effort to to reconcile, then we need to understand it's not a sign of weakness that we're portraying. By saying we're sorry. By saying I need to be closer to God. I need a different walk with I need to examine my life. When we do these things, folks, we're opening the door for possibilities that only God can see ahead. Because when we say things like, forgive me, I hurt your feelings, forgive me, we need to make this right. And when we say we're sorry to God, when we fall on our faces before holy God and we say, Lord, forgive me, for doing whatever we've done, for not doing whatever we were supposed to do, then God takes that and he can heal you. He can heal me. He can heal churches. We were talking about this a little bit this morning, about how we're we're coming upon the, the threshold of tonight's great event, this harvest event. Tonight is an opportunity it's not a problem or it's not a, a, something that we're being burdened with. This is an opportunity, not only for us to see lost people saved. And I pray tonight that, that, that there's so many people saved that the counselors are, are hollering calf rope. Amen? That's a Greek term for I give up. <laughs> for those of you not around here, amen? I mean, I got a PhD, but I use a lot of farm boy technology too. And I'll say a lot of phrases that you may or may not understand, but farm boy technology goes a long way with me, amen? Just plain spoken. So here it is. We've got this opportunity coming, and I want to see all these people say, but you want to know something else. I, I, I believe we serve the greatest, the greatest God because he is only God. He's holy God, Amen. Now, this is it. This is what I believe can happen. I believe we can see people saved. Now, get ready for this because this is going to just, you better, if you got pew bells, you better put them on because this is going to strike some of you crazy. I want to see every church just get along together and just bring glory to God and not care about who's the biggest, best, baddest, and the fastest. Amen? I want to see God glorified through that kind of an effort. I do. I want to see lives changed. At the end of this message, I want to see what God has done. I want to see what God is going to do. And you know what? It excites me. I love, I love doing God's work. And so often, we allow God's work to go by the wayside, each and every one of us. I'm just as guilty as anyone here. But here's 
here's the amazing thing to me. That when I do get into where, into this gear where God wants me to be, we can see things happen. Amen? How many of you know someone in your families that's lost right now? Just would you be so bold and lift your hand? Is that you? You know somebody that's like that? How many of you know somebody that's saved and yet they, 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 they've got issues? You don't have to name them. I don't want you to. How many of you know someone like that? And you can raise your hand for yourself. That's okay. Because it's all between us and God, no one else. Now, how many of you know someone right now who has a friend, a family member, or someone like that who is apart from God right now, just apart from God, and they're out in the wilderness, and, and they need that, that, that prodigal son experience to bring them back home? How many of you know someone like that? Lift your hands up. Yeah. Do you believe God can do all that? I believe that God can not only save souls tonight, grow churches together, but I believe that a great, great revival can happen right here, starting at Gardendale, Alabama tonight, and I believe it can spread like wildfire, and I believe we can see lives changed, and we can see a great movement of the Holy Spirit throughout this whole country if we will all do what we're called to do. Amen. I'll amen them. You don't have to. Let's look at God's power due to reconciliation. Look at verses 18 and 19. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Whose job is it now? It's ours. If God has saved us, it is our job. It is our task. When I, when I decided to, to pursue this Ph.D., I spoke with a lot of, a lot of smart people. John Hambright was one of them. And Brother John and I had, a, had an extensive conversation. And he convinced me that this was what I should do too. He gave me all the points that I thought I already had, but he, he just kind of reaffirmed them to me. And when it became time to do all this coursework, this is what the, 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 almost every professor that I had, they said, read the literature for the topic that you're going to be researching, that you're going to do your dissertation on. So read all of this, and folks, I'm going to tell you something. I read and read and read and read. I could have puked blood by the time I was through reading. I told Debbie when we went for graduation, I said, I don't even want to read my name on the program. I've read that much, amen? But the thing that these professors pointed out was, you need to go ahead and you need to locate the gap in the theory in the literature that exists, so you can expound on that and therefore grow the field of research in that specific topic. And so as I begin to study all of this, I notice this, this obvious gap in this literature of this passage of the Bible, and it's about reconciliation. And so it made me research a little bit more. In Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 11 Paul writes to the Roman church, he says, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. He further writes in Romans 11 and 15, For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead. Then he wrote to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, 13 through 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the living wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into one new man thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross having by having put to, to death the enmity. Folks, I started picking all this stuff up. That reconciliation is, is a critical part of how we live as Christians. It's not only for a lost person to be reconciled with, with God and to be saved, but it's also about Christians who need to be reconciled to God in order to 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 properly serve him and to faithfully serve him. We've been given a 
a stellar opportunity tonight to go out, to display unity, to display the love of Jesus Christ. And folks, it doesn't matter if it's some other denomination, and I'm not here to name denominations, but as Brother Donnie has so eloquently prayed this morning that, that really and truly the church would come together, not as, not as a single church of, from different sections, but as one great church whose sole idea is to serve the Lord and to see him glorified. How tremendous would that be? How life-changing would it be? What kind of power could we see come from that? Folks, we've been blessed to have a, a great choir like, like we have here at Enon, to have wonderful talent. But what if we all came together at one time? Could you imagine how powerful and invigorating that would be for Christians? Could, that gives me holy ghost bumps there, folks. When I think about how many people would gather together and, and begin to, to, to sing out to Jesus Christ, you think it sounds pretty good in here with a big crowd. You just think about hundreds of thousands of people praising God at one time. One of the greatest functions that I ever got to attend, I went to uh, Indianapolis one time for a promise keepers meeting. It was one of the very first ones that they had. And while I was there, I had already become acquainted with, with a, a pastor out of Los Angeles whose name was Dr. E.V. Hill. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Hill. He was a fabulous preacher. And I saw Dr. Hill from across the room, and he locked eyes on me, and he came over there. He said, now, he, this guy has to have met thousands of people, thousands and thousands. And he locked eyes with me, Donnie, and he said, Brother Steve, how goes the preaching? Now, how did he remember all of that? And I had to ask that. He said, last, he said, the first time I met you, he said, you were sharing Jesus with a deacon at Shaco Springs. A deacon. They're supposed to be saved, right? You know what happened? That deacon was saved. And he went and he told his pastor. And you know what happened? His pastor got saved. He said, what are we going to tell these people when we get back to church? He said, I'll tell you what we're going to tell them, pastor. As good of a pastor as you've been as a lost man, you just think about how good you're going to be as a saved man. I don't know what happened with all of that, but I do know this. I know that the opportunity was there. And God, when God moves on your heart, he compels you today to get up and to come call that name of that lost person. When God's Holy Spirit tweaks your heart, and he tells you it's time for us to reconcile. When God stirs in your heart and you know that you can't remember that conversation that you had with Jesus. You can't recall that time that you stopped and that you asked Jesus to forgive you of all your sins, to come into your heart and be your Savior. Don't hesitate in coming because here's the third point. Here's God's promise. Watch this in verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Friends, let me tell you something. We can't be righteous without Jesus Christ. We can't be clothed without his blood first cleansing all of our sins. And so this begs the question this morning. What are you going to do with Jesus? Because I promise you this right here. Listen to me carefully. You can have just as much of God as you want this morning. Did you hear me? 
You can have come in the presence of God and walk away, and it may change your life some, but until you get what God wants you to get, we're not going to experience what God can do in our lives. Amen? So here's what we're going to do. God's promise is the result of, of sinners being reconciled. God's promise is that if you'll trust me, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus promises us in John chapter 10 and 28 that nothing's going to be able to snatch you out of his hand. Jesus promises that. It's all because we reconciled our hearts with God. Would you all stand, please? Brother Ken is going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. And I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, there may be some here this morning. You raised your hand. You know that lost loved one. You know that, that, that loved one that's astray. And while we can pray at our pews, I get that we can. But folks, let me tell you something. There's just something humbling and powerful about it when we come and we kneel down around this altar because we unify. So I'm going to ask you, as Brother Ken begins to lead us in this song, this hymn of invitation in just a moment, that you break out of the bonds of those pews and things that's holding you. You step out and you come. You call that name out. Father, bless us right now. Give us courage. Give us strength. And bless us in Jesus' name we ask you. Amen.